Hey guys, uh, my name is Randy Pitcher. I am a data engineer for HashMap. We're a consulting company um, in the area. And today we're gonna talk about data pipelining for Snowflake. Uh, so who here is maybe a Snowflake user today? Yeah, okay. Uh, anyone POCing or considering it in the near future? Right on, cool, okay. So um, this, this topic is uh, probably the first thing you'll get to after the demo, right? Where it's like, cool, this was fast, I ran SQL, now what? How do I get data in, in a cheap way? So that's what we'll talk about today, some best patterns. And again, if you have any questions, just jump up. So something uh, for the slides, I have a bit.ly link if you guys wanna follow along or you wanna see them later. I'll send it out after the meetup. So you guys don't have to memorize this, but uh, it's bit.ly slash OKC Snowflake dash four. Uh, this is our fourth meetup. We'll always follow this pattern. So if you can't make one, we always try to either have a recording or have some documentation you can follow along yourself. And you can go and see the first and second one right now too. Okay. So I always like to start with this, um, this picture. And it's not for the Snowflake like experts in the room, it's not strictly perfectly technically accurate. Uh, but the privileges I've taken, the, the kind of uh, simplification I've done, I think gives people a really, really good gut understanding quickly about how Snowflake is built. So this is the architecture of how under the hood, Snowflake does all of its magic. Uh, the separation of storage and compute is probably one of the first things someone has told you about Snowflake. They keep those separate. Uh, on the storage layer uh, for either S3 in AWS or in Azure, it'll be Blob. Um, GCP is now recently supported. Uh, I don't know anything about that yet. So we're, we're gonna stick mostly to Azure and uh, AWS today. I think that's probably safe here in OKC. I only know like one person using GCP. Um, so they store the raw files, but also some metadata about these files in the, the stores here in a, like a proprietary way that allows them to get really, really efficient pruning of the data so that when you run a query, you don't have to scan every piece of data. You just grab the parts that are useful to look at. And that allows it to add lots of performance and some really cool caching benefits uh, without you having to do anything specifically. Now, the compute side of the house uh, is probably what we're more familiar with. This is where we have the virtual warehouses uh, and they can have some arbitrary number of nodes uh, based on the t-shirt size you've chosen. So this one here has two nodes that's a uh, small. Uh, warehouse, and they'll they'll maintain some cache about the raw data as long as it doesn't change while you're querying. And then my favorite part that's often overlooked is the service layer cache. So when you submit a query to Snowflake, word for word, if you run that query, it'll take an amount of time, but if you run it again, you'll get the results back uh, because it caches your word for word results based on a query. If the underlying data didn't change, you won't even turn on a warehouse. So for the BI folks, which I think for me, that's the number one use case I'm trying to serve is make cool pictures run fast. Um, the result set cache is my best friend because I can run things lightning fast with no cost. So I, I wanted to set the tone here today because what we're gonna talk about is more on the storage side. How do we get data into Snowflake? So these S3 and Blob components, you won't actually ever see. These are owned by Snowflake. This is part of the managed service. But depending on which cloud you're on, if you're taking your flat files, and landing them somewhere, which most services can get you to like a CSV or a JSON or a Parquet, or whatever. Uh, drop those in your corresponding cloud. So either S3 if you're on AWS, Snowflake, or Azure. And that is what we're gonna target today for ingesting automatically directly into these services. Any questions on this page or anything like that? Okay, I'm gonna show <laughs> maybe a little overwhelming graph or chart next. This is the ecosystem in a very generic sense that we're talking about outside of Snowflake. So we talked about how Snowflake works on the inside. On the outside, we have some on the left arbitrary number of sources or kinds of data. We see unstructured being like PDFs, videos, JPEGs, things like that. Things that, you know, we're gonna do AIML on those one day. But for now, um, most people aren't. Uh, REST data, so this is for like really niche especially if you're in industry specific in software as a service, uh, they only expose an API, you have to write something custom to ingest it. Uh, those exist. The streaming data sources, which um, more often we don't see people pumping directly into stream processing, they land actually in a structured database and then we replicate into Snowflake. And then of course the good old RDBMS, the um, Microsoft SQL Server, the, the Oracle Store, anything like that. Uh, but the, the parts that are important for today, and we'll, we'll come back to this in future uh, meetups, this is the ecosystem broadly. 
We're gonna focus on the cloud file storage part. This is the part you own and you're externally staging. And then the Snowflake relationship. So how, you'll notice a lot of these relationships, uh, especially in the non-commodity data source space, they get ingested into the file storage, not directly into Snowflake. And that's because that's a good intermediary where you can drop stuff cheaply and lots of other services already support dumping into either Blob or um, AWS S3. So we are gonna target how, once you have data there, can you get it into Snowflake in a repeatable, measurable, cheap way? Any questions on the ecosystem? Great. So this is it. This is the whole thing we're gonna talk about today. Um, generally, you will want to take your flat files, CSV, JSON, whatever they are, and first part, ingest them here from cloud file storage into a transient staging table. Um, this, this whole picture here, I have a recipe for, like a nine step process. I'll, I'll give you guys at the end. Uh, but the really important key terms here are Snowpipe and transient staging tables. Who here uses Snowpipe? Okay, so let's talk about Snowpipe. Snowpipe is the continuous uh, ingestion um, object in Snowflake, uh, specifically the auto ingest. This is super important compared to a copy command. A copy command, when you run it against an external stage, is gonna first, before it does anything, check the entire stage for what files exist which can be, in my case with CloudTrail, I've seen billions of files. It's gonna look for all of that. Next step, it's gonna look for the source table, the staging table you're ingesting into, and it's gonna see what file metadata you've already ingested. And it'll compare those two, which can be computationally expensive, and then only ingest the new stuff. That's really good when you have six files, because it's like, well, I just run copy and I'm done. Uh, but as you accrue data, often people don't clean up that stage, they wanna keep it for historical reasons, or they wanna roll off to an archive. Um, if you don't clean that up and it gets to be hundreds of millions of records, every ingestion you run will have, in a case I saw recently, as long as an hour just to figure out what to ingest before you do anything. And the use case needed you to ingest every 15 minutes. So it, it didn't work at all. So Snowpipe allows you to get around that because when new files will land in the stage, it triggers a notification to the pipe for that specific file. And the pipe will only ingest the newly arriving files rather than scraping the entire stage to find out what should be ingested. This is gonna save you money in two ways. One, you're not gonna to have to run a warehouse just to do a quick list comparison, which can be expensive. And second, uh, it's all fully managed. You don't have to provision a dedicated warehouse um, that you have to right size and maybe you end up running something super big for a small job or the other way around. This is all built into Snowflake as a service. So if you're not using Snowpipe for these kind of ingestions, uh, you should really consider it. Next step is the transient staging table. So in general, the life cycle we have here is we want to land the data mostly raw with maybe a little metadata about how we ingested it and then eventually get it to a cleaned state. This is a state where you consider it the first part of your model and then you start building probably context around that, joins uh, more complex computations eventually to be consumed by some application. Getting to the clean table is our cutoff today, uh, but in future discussions, we can talk about where to go from there. The transient staging table though, who here knows about transient tables in Snowflake? Okay, so in Snowflake, you have different classes of tables. Um, with time travel and like your undrop features, there's a lot of metadata that gets accrued for a typical table. And it can go back as far as 90 days. So your storage costs can get pretty expensive and the redundancy uh, involved can make things a little slow. <clears throat> a transient table is as persistent, but not as much history, not as much metadata is stored. It's intended to not exist for very long. These are perfect for landing data into because they'll write faster and they won't incur a lot of metadata for data that you're fundamentally not gonna actually query against. You're gonna query against the cleaned data. Um, back to the CloudTrail example, when you ingest the CloudTrail data, it is as a JSON. So you're in Tableau, Spotfire, Power BI dashboards, they're not gonna know what to do with that at all. They'll treat it like a string. So largely that's useless. You wanna clean it first step. So knowing that we have this transient staging table where data is gonna first land, uh, that's gonna keep our costs down with Snowpipe, that's gonna continuously ingest, it's automatic right out of the box, and we wanna get to the clean table, what's the best way to orchestrate that transition? Do, do any of you use external uh, orchestration solutions for your Snowflake instance? Anything like that? Okay, so yeah, so some people do, um, other people, uh, streams and tasks, 
This is a common internal mechanism in Snowflake. It's relatively new this year that they've announced that. Uh, so we're gonna create a stream object. This is a, a great way to do CDC. So the stream is a really bad name, by the way, for these things. Uh, we're gonna create a stream object against the transient staging table so that when data lands, we will record what new da data has existed, whether it was an upsert, a delete, update. Most of this will be append only. I recommend doing that. And then when you run a scheduled task to suck that data up, process it, and write it somewhere else, the stream will erase the processed data. And over time, it'll only store difference. So in the past, you might have to grab all data by querying the clean table, seeing what you have already, grabbing just the stuff that you don't have yet, and that's a query that takes time to do, and then processing. With the stream, you can avoid that, so that's gonna save you a lot of money. The scheduled task and dedicated warehouse, this combo, so for folks that uh, are maybe from a more traditional data warehousing background, um, you can't just spin up new warehouses. These are physical things in your data center. So you give them a name and you treat them like a pet and you hope no one runs something super expensive against them because it'll bring down everything. In this world, you want to have dedicated cattle warehouses. They're not your special pets. They are ephemeral. You create them, you spin them up, you destroy them, you get rid of them. So for your individual task, each task should have a dedicated warehouse that's on a dedicated schedule. The scheduled task embeds an amount of transformation that can be reused. So with your scheduled task, you can do an initial JSON flatten to get your array out, and then you trigger a follow-up task that will then take that flattened array and process the JSON values out of it to make a structured clean table. So you can chain these together as much as you want. I often find that putting them all together is pretty good. You can leverage the cache really effectively on the warehouse. Uh, and then you land into your clean table. This should be a traditional table in most cases, so you'll want that longer metadata. If you have a ton of churn, meaning like you're running every minute into that, you may wanna not keep that one. You may want that one to be transient as well and then use cloning or something else. Uh, the reason is that high churn means higher metadata storage. So a pretty small table, like a terabyte table, I mean, that's big. But like a 100 gigabyte table could produce as much as like two terabytes of metadata store because it's churning so much. Every new entry is appended in the, in the history. So this is the general ecosystem of how this stuff should work. Any, any questions so far? I know it's a lot all at once, but the key takeaways are get flat files into my stage. Ingest those with Snowpipe, not the copy command. Schedule your transformations with dedicated warehouses and probably don't store metadata with your landing tables, your staging zone. Okay. Here are some other rather quick tips. These are things I've experienced just doing things that no one would ever do with Snowflake, just breaking things, just to break them. Um, first one, when you ingest, you have a copy command um, that will grab all rows of a source file and ingest into some table you've defined. I really strongly recommend that you add an ingestion time and row hash value. You can add custom values as you ingest. The ingestion time allows you to record a specific ingestion action and you know all of this data even though it may have sub timestamps for what happened the ingestion time is all the same this allows you to append data rather than have to deal with really expensive merge logic so if you're doing a snapshot of a database every day um, for a lot of people they would initially just try to merge that difference or totally overwrite a table or just take the differences and uh, process those you lose the ability to do time you know, like month over month changes. So if you have in inventory and you only ever replicate the current snapshot of that inventory, you're not able to see how things have changed over time and you lose the ability to make a lot of decisions. Uh, so that's what ingestion time is good for. And if you never use it, that's fine. It is really, really, really cheap to just add at the beginning and make that a part of your standard ingestions. The next part is row hash. This is a little on the computational science side. Um, one thing that I often have to do for these ingestions is deduplicate data as part of the transformation. Um, if you have maybe 100 columns, a normal deduplication uh, process will have to compare each one of those 100 columns with every other row, uh, making a really expensive equals check. A row hash, uh, it's like a, a checksum, MD5 checksum, where you take at ingestion time, row by row, just a single like 
int value that represents the, the source rows. And that value, if any part of any of those columns has a different value, will produce a different uh, hash value. This allows you to really, really, really cheaply, really speed up your deduplication efforts, and it allows you to do row level joining really, really fast. So you could have sub one. So if you know you have a um, composite key, or it's not an official key, but you know you often join on the same four columns, you could do the same trick with the hash because it'll be, um, especially like joining billions and billions of rows against hundreds of millions of rows, this can save you a ton in performance. So that's my first tip, always add these things. Um, as far as how do you stage your data for the most parallelizable processing, uh, keep files between 10 and 100 megabytes. Um, this is directly from Snowflake. The reason is when you were processing some n number of files, uh, Snowflake is able to distribute that across a warehouse that maybe has as many uh, as maybe 256 nodes, I think, or 128. Uh, that allows you to do the same amount of work in 128th amount of the time for the same price if you can parallelize it really well. However, if you have one massive file, then only one warehouse node can ever process it. And I'll often see people have uh, a full 300 gigabyte CSV file that gets produced every month. And they'll spin up an extra large warehouse and try to ingest it, not realizing that most of those nodes are just sitting. They're not processing at all. And well, it's slow. Well, yeah, it's slow. You should use an extra small or break your files up. Uh, on the, the other end of that, below 10 megabytes, um, the overhead of grabbing the files from these source systems is too much compared to the actual processing work. A lot of your work is just busy work trying to find files and keep them straight. So that's uh, another best practice that'll save you money. Um, JSON files, so who here ingests semi-structured data into Snowflake? Yeah, yeah, so it's one of the best parts of the, of the platform. So I can take REST data, ingest it as is, and then build flattened um, relational views depending on my end tool. Uh, JSON, uh, has a limit, a column limit in Snowflake of 16 megabytes uncompressed. The way staging works is when you try to ingest a JSON file, the whole file is treated as one column, dollar sign one, and you extract individual values from that. So if your file is bigger than 16 megabytes, you, even though the ingestion limits aren't being violated, the limit of what a JSON column can be is now violated, and you'll get failures. And I've had this, again, in CloudTrail. I just do so much CloudTrail with JSON. Um, so avoid that if you can. Try to break those things up into uh, smaller files or a different schema. Maybe do a little, I don't know, modeling to avoid that. Um, the last part is the pipe refresh command. So anyone here, this is a little esoteric. If you use Snowpipe, uh, to establish your continuous ingestion, they have this part uh, called the refresh, where after it's been set up, you call alter pipe refresh, and it will go and grab the data that already is in the stage that it hasn't been monitoring um, when you existed. So if you have a stage that already has two years worth of data and you're setting up the snow pipe now, it'll only grab new data, but that's not very useful. You wanna do the historical load. Um, one limitation of the refresh is it'll only grab data that's less than a week old in the stage. So you are now in a world where you have to juggle both copy commands, which are not easy to continuously ingest data with, and pipe uh, orchestration tools or, or pipe approaches, which don't go back very far. Um, you can get around this sometimes with good bucket design or, or staging like in your raw file design so that data is always cleaned up, it only arrives right when you wanna process it and you don't use it for other purposes. Um, but for some things like if you're ingesting uh, application logs, there are other things using this data. You can't just move it around and sometimes it's massive. So uh, the trick here, use that hash, use copy to ingest, no pipe to automate and do an initial deduplication to make sure you will have overlap, which often is more tolerable than missed data, just uh, drop the duplicates, that'll help. And then the last part, um, kind of a bad thing about snow pipes, and I hope they change this. Uh, snow pipes, because they don't use a dedicated warehouse that you've designed, which can save you money, um, all of the billing across, say, some arbitrary 20, 30 ETL snow pipe jobs are just consolidated to snow pipe in the uh, account section of Snowflake. So your line item just shows you the total cost of running all your pipes. That's not super good if you're trying to determine which sources are worth spending money on or what's the driver of your ingestion cost. 
So it's kind of hard. You have to do a little digging to find out where you should invest development effort to improve costs on ingestions. Uh, and that sucks. Materialized views, I don't know if you guys use those at all. Those are super popular in Snowflake for BI. Um, they are a similar thing. So all your materialized views will be billed as the same line item, uh, which is not great. Materialized views especially can really rack up charges. I recommend, except for certain cases, uh, staying away from them because when people say we need a real-time view of this data and a materialized view will give us the real-time, up-to-date, best performing BI landing or, or target, uh, five minute delay is actually fine, or 10 minute delay. And that difference can save you a ton of money and improve your cache. Uh, because the cache will invalidate every time the source data changes, and if you're constantly updating the source data, you will lose the cache entirely. So any benefits you might have gained from materializing that view might go out the window by losing the cache. Any questions? Cool. Uh, and as promised, don't read this. Here are the specific steps to do that diagram. Um, as far as like, what do you take away from today? Take this back, try this for, especially your kind of um, net new ingestion work, see how it works out, compare it maybe to your traditional approach, and you can make an informed decision on whether this is worth it. The good part, it seems like a lot, it's the same for each thing I do. So I've actually got a lot of templates I've built, just, you just fill in the blanks. Uh, where's your S3 bucket? Boom, I get the URL, I place it there. Uh, what's the actual path to the source file? What is the file format? Uh, and then I just drop it into my staging table that goes through a stream, which goes to a, a clean table, which is then ready to consume. And then when I leave, as a consultant, I will leave. Um, no one has to be like, hey, how did this work? It's all self-describing, it's all embedded into the data, uh, and it's automated. So they don't have to worry about it breaking after I leave. Any questions? Okay, well, uh, this is all I have for today. Um, this kind of thing I typically like doing demos on, but it is really hard to set up a live data source for you guys to pull stage from um, here. So uh, if you have any other questions or you want to do a demo after this, let me know. Yeah. Oh yeah, sure. So the question was around, um, at the beginning of the talk, we, we mentioned um, analytics BI best practices, how to save money on that. Uh, and just the question was, that would be cool. Uh, I can maybe talk a little bit about it now. I don't have slides or anything, but I mean, do you guys wanna, wanna discuss that maybe? Okay, cool. So the name of the game in BI, first, uh, your storage is way cheaper than your compute in Snowflake. We are just running numbers on this because I'm blogging about this. Uh, for HashMap in July, which was our top build month, uh, it was so top build that I had to take control of things and that's why August was a lot cheaper. But in July, we spent about $750 on credits and we spent about 16 cents on storage, uh, which is a huge difference. So people who would go and be like, man, we could store this you know, in a more normalized way, quit duplicating data, and we could save our footprint. Doesn't matter, doesn't matter at all, go away. Uh, we need to drop compute. Often you can trade compute for storage by not computing your BI at read time in a production environment. You do, do that for, for dev stuff because it's really fast to just define a view. Um, for production stuff, you should be persisting that to a denormalized flattened view that is catered to the specific use case you have, keeping your model data intact and using a data mart methodology. That will allow you to not have to do as much compute on read, and in general with BI, you compute to store once and you compute to read many, many times. So that's where you can save a lot of money. Uh, the next part is for our, like something like this, where we do a continuous ingestion. Anytime a file arrives, even if it arrives multiple times a minute, Snowflake's gonna pick it up and ingest it. It's gonna trigger in your every five minute or 10 minute task a process, but if you use a materialized view, it would happen constantly. Uh, you want to, let's go to this picture, maximize the blue part as much as possible. Two things will happen to uh, invalidate that blue part. One, underlying data will change. So how do you keep your BI from accessing data that's constantly changing? You can do that really, really cheaply, this is my favorite use case for this, with uh, data cloning. 
So zero copy cloning in Snowflake on your top table will allow you to make a snapshot with no copy time, it's instant. And your cache will stay valid. So if you need to update data continuously for your data modeling purposes, but you only need to update it for consumption every half hour or hour, trigger a task that creates a clone to do that. And that'll take no additional time, it's just instant and it's been updated. Uh, and usually you can give that to your end business users, like how often do you need this, daily? Oh, okay, cool, let's uh, pull from the cache the entire day. It'll never turn on a warehouse when people are consuming it, as long as your uh, queries are the same. Uh, the other side of that is if you're using something like Tableau, I often recommend using custom SQL to connect to this. The reason is that you can control the word for word SQL a lot better that ends up hitting the endpoint, and then your extractions can hit the cache, and then you do your cubing on the client. The same for Power BI. Uh, I think it's the same for Salesforce. I've just never gotten into the guts there and tried to make that happen. So, to recap, this blue cache is the name of the game. It's always what you want to try to optimize for because it's free to hit. The orange cache is good, and that's where you want to optimize for queries that you can't get to be word for word the same. You're not really going to hit that blue cache but the underlying data doesn't need to be refreshed as often. So you keep the warehouses running. Those caches invalidate when the warehouse turns off, alters size, or when uh, the underlying data changes. So you fix the data changing part, you keep your warehouse running often, give it some auto scaling. And then this is a really good use case for like data scientists, let them hit that. Or if you trust them, just have them do a CSV extract and do dev off a of static sampling of the files. I know this is a lot, we, we could do this in a more structured way, like where you don't have to memorize it all. Does that kind of help? Yeah, I would, I would love to do a blog. Yeah, okay, cool. Um, we'll definitely do that, and then the blog I'm working on, that'll help a lot too. Uh, but the name of the game, the, the mantra to remember, is that always optimize for reducing your compute by computing earlier, and uh, increasing your storage by storing in many, many different ways that seem redundant. But if you flatten in four or five different ways and store it once an hour, that's a lot better than having it stored in the generic way and having every one of your consumers constantly tweaking the data a little bit and using the small warehouse, but the warehouse will keep running minimum of, of a, a minute every time. So if you have more than one person a minute querying, it's gonna be a constant run. Uh, so that trade-off you can typically make in some fashion by storing more computing less. And things go faster, that's the other part. It's not just cheaper, that cache is lightning quick. So your end users, they care about latency, they don't care about how many billions of rows you chewed through. Um, you can make that look better too. Cool, good question. Yeah. So I tried loading some data, not using Snowfire, just by clicking the data drains and doing the load data, pulling my CSV or anything. And I was like, for a little bit, I started putting the budget of the errors about yeah. 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 So a couple things. Um, the first is the named object called file format in Snowflake. There's two different ways to interact with Snowflake broadly. There's programmatic way to access it, which I like a lot as a consultant because I can just send you the SQL. Just run this. You're done. I don't have to do screenshots. The other way, which a lot of actual users like, is you can just dive in and start clicking around. For what you did, it sounded like you used the GUI to upload a file from your local machine, which is a super fast way to get started, by the way. You should all do that. Uh, and when you were tweaking the file format, because it's going to ask you what kind of data is a CSV, JSON, um, how is it delimit, del, delineated, delimiter, right? Um, should we skip errors? Should we freak out? What should we do? All those things, they get kind of complex in the UI. But what you can do is define a named file format that's going to be stored inside of a schema, just like a table. Uh, I do this a lot for different types of AWS loads. So I'll write a Lambda function that extracts data in a specific JSON format I know about. And then I can define in the definition of the stage, which connects to it, that the default file format is this one I set up that's going to be JSON. It's going to skip on errors, um, and I will handle the nulls myself. Uh, but in other cases, that's a, that's a deal breaker any amount of error is intolerant. So what I would recommend is that for your specific file format, whether the encoding it sounds like was off, you can define an encoding. So was it a CSV? Yeah. 
Yeah, so I suspect, and I don't know this for sure, but in the Snowflake docs, you can define what kind of encoding you want. If that doesn't work, it is super simple to read it into Python and then save as UTF-8 encoding. Um, often, people are getting the CSVs from Excel. If this is their first time, they're gonna save as CSV. Um, and I think there's different ways you can save the CSV. There's like a couple options. Yeah, so it's a really good question, but it'll come up continuously. So always, always test your pipes before turning them on. Cool, does that help? Yeah. Cool. Okay, so uh, if there are no more questions, I am gonna shut this down, we'll turn off the recording, and then we can just chat. <laughs>